part two of the Northwoods Law Canines, episode 39. And this is going to be the conclusion, and we're going to talk to the two other canine handlers we have, Eric Fluett, Bob Mancini, and then a future canine handler with Ken St. Pierre. And uh, he's going to reveal a little surprise for you that you're not going to be able to see on TV. Well, you probably will see it on TV, but you're going to hear it first at Ward as much. So <laughs> get excited. And, uh, you know, me and John Norris are such dog people. And it's just, it's so good to bring this into Warden's Watch. And, you know, even the Thin Green Line and everybody that, that uses dogs in conservation. It, it's just an awesome thing, John. And, you know, when I talked to Sarah Gardner, the 4-H leader, and I'm a 4-H leader, we talked first. You mentioned this companion dog uh, program in California and I, I'd never heard about it and Sarah and I talked about it after we were like uh, yeah let's let's ask John about that because I've, I've never heard that and it, it just and he always mentions companion dog companion dog companion dog and you always post pictures of your yellow lab on, on, on Instagram it's you know and that just shows you how connected you are to your dog too <laughs> Yeah, the uh, Wayne, the, the cool thing is, and, and something I didn't realize that a lot of other states in our world of uh, conservation agencies aren't necessarily doing, and I, I hope they do more of them, you know, uh, throughout the nation, is we kind of have a three-prong approach to our canine program. And that first level is, you know, not a certified detection dog or a certified dual-purpose apprehension detection dog that obviously has to be vetted, extensive training. Uh, handlers have to go through, you know, all of their canine training, be selected, be vetted by supervisors and canine administrators. Uh, and that's a long process. So the companion dog program we have in California, any game warden that has a dog that's been through obedience training and tested by an administrator um, that's had, you know, their licensing, their rabies shots, their vaccinations um, can patrol with an officer. So the nice part about it is, is we can have our dogs with us, every officer in the fleet can, so to speak, um, even if they're not a certified canine handler in detection or dual purpose apprehension detection. So we have a majority of our wardens in California having their dogs on patrol with them. And I was one of those guys even before we started to, to develop advanced canine tactics for the marijuana enforcement team and, you know, Phoebe's story and, and that level of, of, of canine work. Um, my first lab was Jordan, and she was a companion dog ever since we really got back on track with the canine program around 2005, 2006. And even though she wasn't certified in detection, uh, that dog made so many cases, you know, ad hoc when we were in the woods, finding, you know, undersized fish that were hidden, finding over limits, finding untagged deer, finding bait piles, and just being able to melt the ice and get a confession, help me get confessions out of suspects that I would have never caught or made a case on because they saw that dog work in her nose and they know how good dogs can detect. So um, they're amazing just to have as a, as a companion. And when you're the only solo warden out there and you got nobody and you don't have, you know, backup two hours away or more, it's kind of nice to have even a companion dog. Um, Apollo, my second dog after Jordan passed in 2010, Apollo was a companion dog with me from right at six months. She was one of the youngest, labs to pass basic obedience that the chief put her through uh, very smart dog so we got her through at six months wow. and she worked with me right at, right up until retirement at the end of 2018 and she's she's pushing 11 years old now um, and she had another you know companion career like like jordan did she made a lot of cases when we were starting the marijuana enforcement emphasis on the cartel operations she would go in early season not to not to detect officially and not to definitely apprehend anybody because that yellow lab isn't going to bite any gunman <laughs> she's uh -huh. going to lick them to death but she would detect marijuana very far away because of that great nose of hers before we could even smell it and actually saved our lives several times in the early season of, of uh, cultivation when we were about to walk into a new grow site with a small scout team. So little things like that, man, just make it awesome. And um, had gr obviously two great companion dogs during my career. And you're a dog guy and you have your, your, uh, your dogs and most of the wardens we know have them. So mm. the companion dog program is cool. And I hope other States, uh, you know, get on board with it. And the other cool thing about it is it also helps get the right handlers kind of in, in line to go further into the canine program and become an official canine handler because they've got a dog with them all the time. You know, they know the ins and outs of, you know, the logistics of what it's going to take to take care of that dog, where you're going to put them, how they're going to act on patrol inside and outside of the vehicle. So all of those things come into bear. And we, uh, we, you know, groom up a lot of canine handlers just by having a companion dog early in their career. 
Mm. Well, Colonel Jordan wraps up our podcast, so hopefully he's going to listen to the whole thing and, and hear about yeah. the canine uh, <laughs> companion dog. And is, is Apollo still with you? Is that the dog that I'm seeing on Instagram that still runs with you and stuff like that? Yeah, or? that's that's her. Yeah, that's yeah. her. She's a little English yellow lab, little 50-pound fire plug and kind of small, fits everywhere. But, yeah, she's still, uh, she's still trucking. She doesn't run as fast as she used to, but she's still out there on the trail with me every day, three to five miles. And, uh, you know, up, up in on hunts and things like that and, uh, and goes everywhere, you know, and when I'm doing the outreach road show, she's in the car, she's in the truck, travels great. And, uh, yeah, but I'm sure like, like some of the dogs you've had, she's starting to get up there in years and she's slowing down a little bit. And I'm just hoping, you know, uh, we're blessed to have her another couple of years at least because she's, she's been an amazing dog and that's going to be, she's going to be a hard family member to lose when the time comes. Yeah, no, my shepherd's at 11, and he's certainly showing oh, his age. Yeah. So, but he still shows <laughs> yeah. his intelligence. In the hot days, I open the, the door to the basement. He goes down and spends the day in the basement and comes up at <laughs> night. He, he's, he's very, very sharp. I will say that. He's always been very intelligent, and I, I can still see that. And I keep pointing that out to my son, who has the German wire hair pointer, cork. And uh, I keep showing him the difference between uh, the pointer and the shepherd, the, the, the actually the right. working, working versus is just the instinct go 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 <laughs> i love it man that's so cool <laughs> but she, she does a dynamic job she's been uh first place quite a few times in the 4-h dog shows with obedience and that was always my strong wow. point was the obedience so yeah so he's he's a pretty proud kid of his dog and, and, and should be so and that's kind of neat why bringing on the 4-h into this and hopefully cultivating new dog handlers as game wardens in the future because 4-H kids love the outdoors. They get a passion, get a passion for animals and it's, it's just, it fits well. So I'm, I'm pretty excited we were able to do this podcast and join them. And then remember Ruby, uh, our, our handlers, uh, our, our, our lead handlers who's running the program now canine and everybody saw her on Northwoods law and followed her. So that was a tragic event for uh, viewers of that show as well as, as Bill. Yeah. So, um, Glad we yeah. could do all this and, and wrap it up. So, um, so episode 39, it's going pretty quick, huh, man? Oh, it really is, man. It's trucking right along. And thanks to all of our listeners and viewers, you guys are really making this show fun. Um, you're motivating different topics from, from both Wayne and I. And, and the cool thing about it is this one, like you said, Wayne, is very special because it's so canine heavy. You know, it hits heavy on the emotional level. And uh, I think you guys are going to love this one. This one is uh, this one's special. Enjoy it. Yeah, and I'm looking forward with a post of you and Apollo again. I know you got quite a few of them out there, but now would be a good time to do another one. <laughs> one's, I, I won't give the farm away, buddy, but one's coming real soon. <laughs> okay, that's great, John. Yeah. So I hope everybody enjoys episode 39, part two, Northwoods Law Dogs. Thanks. And next in our lineup of New Hampshire Conservation Officer Canine Handlers is Eric Fluett, who handles canine moxie and eric's been on this show before so he's no uh no newbie to podcasting he's he's new to the video stuff and i, I guess i can say i am too so but it's good to see you this morning thank you for joining me eric oh absolutely no this is kind of a neat um podcast that i'm doing a i want to remember ruby you know bill's dog that passed away this past year and you know, I think we all know that these dogs become members of our family. So it's like losing a family member. So certainly, you know, want to do something for Ruby, for Bill. And it's kind of special because of COVID-19, the New Hampshire 4-H dog clubs aren't meeting right now. So they're doing everything virtually, which to be honest with you with dog training, can you imagine doing dog training virtually? Yeah, it's not going so well. So this is kind of uh, expanding different things so so kids can learn different things via the computer, via Zoom, via these interviews. Um, you guys are kind of front and center being on Northwoods Law. You're the, the, the canine handlers on TV right now. So I think that's pretty exciting for these kids. They get to see these dogs work every Sunday night. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> so let's start off with Moxie. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I got a good relationship with Moxie because I was the lieutenant when she came on board with us, and that, that was exciting in itself, and we've come a long ways. But the name, Eric, I mean, did you have a lot of input on the name, or you just kind of pulled that out of the refrigerator, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was uh, right out of the, you know, a Moxie can. So 
Um, yeah, certainly after the, after the soda and, uh, kind of fit well and yeah, it's, uh, was pretty quick to choose. There wasn't a lot of debate, was it? It was like, uh, I don't know what I'm going to call my dog as I reach for the moxie in the refrigerator. Right? <laughs> You're like, here it is, moxie. I love it, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's got that, uh, you know, uh, mixture of, yeah, just, uh, yeah, it's got a good fit for her, I think, so. Yeah, no, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, and you have the only yellow lab, the yellow dog. Yeah, and I don't know if you can tell that it's uh, yellow. This is a relatively uh, newly dry cleaned uniform, so maybe it's not fully yellow hair yet. So, so that's the downside do of having a yellow dog, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've bought more lint rollers in the last uh, three years than I ever have in my life. So, uh, <laughs> That's too funny. Well, at least your girlfriend doesn't have to know that, you know, the blonde is the blonde. So that, that works out fairly good, huh? She's not pulling brunette hair off. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So the process of fixing out Moxie, I mean, were you, were you after a yellow dog or just, uh, how'd that work out? You just went down to some testing and she tested out the best or. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was actually pretty neat because, uh, for, the longest time in my personal life, I, I had actually wanted a yellow lab. Um, so, but really with our, our work, I'm just, you know, not home enough and uh, just never really pursued a dog in my personal life. Um, when this opportunity came up, state phone's going to start going off here. Um, (laughs) That's part of it. So, um, yeah, so when I had the opportunity uh, with you, Wayne, to get, uh, you know, a working dog, uh, it just was was a perfect in any dog, whatever color, you know, make, model it was going to be, uh, would have been just fine. So, um, in any case, uh, Wes and, and Belinda had, you know, were going to give us the next dog, and I'll, I'll never forget, I think it was at, uh, I want to say it was Wild New Hampshire Day, and uh, they, I met with them and, hey, it's, uh, so we've got, it's going to end up being a yellow lab. And I, I was just so ecstatic to, to have that dog that I wanted anyway, you know. So to me, the, the yellow lab was, um, you know, my ideal dog. So uh, since then, uh, yeah, we've been just partners, uh, partners in work and home. Yeah, well, that, that's great. And you know, did you like go down to see the puppies and, you know, Moxie came running right over to you or do you have to beat off 20 puppies or, you know, that, that whole selection on how, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a little stress. You want, this is your partner. This is somebody you're going to spend the, you know, your, your every waking moment with. So uh, that selection process is a uh, pretty, you know, important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so basically in the, in the week or so before we went down to pick, pick her out I got a basically a, a rundown on on canine selection for for our working dogs so just had some quote tests to to run the dogs through and um and basically so we went down um Lieutenant Boudreau and I had no idea the depiction of the previous handlers who went down and checked the dogs out so uh, both uh, James and Bob had had been down and done a selection process uh, before us, to, you know, with tests. So Lieutenant Boudreau and I went down, and uh, of course, you know, there's yeah, numerous uh, cute little yellow labs running around, and they were all yellow. Them. Oh yeah, oh yeah, all yellow labs in a in yeah. a pen, ready to ready to play, chomping at the bit to meet us. So. Um, so ultimately we started selecting one at a time and just running them through the tests and that uh, was kind of neat uh through the same process uh we got down to two dogs and they happened to be the same two dogs that uh both james and bob had gotten the dogs down to so uh, i think it was a red and a, a green collared dog so um so we ended up matching the same two dogs uh, that we felt would be great for our line of work, uh, just the same as uh, James and Bob. That, that's pretty cool. That means your selection process is working. That means, you know, you're, you're picking yeah, up yeah. dogs. For, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so those two, you know, stood out to, to all of us. And, 
And then I'll, I'll never forget, I think it was just, yeah, Bob, you know, uh, Lieutenant Boudreau and I were going back and forth. And, you know, how do I decide? I'm stressing out. I'm losing more hair. It was just, it was bad, you know, just like, I don't want to mess this up. And uh, mm-hmm. it basically, I think everybody, you know, everybody on site was just, hey, you know, which one, which one are you leaning towards and just go with your gut, you know? And, and Moxie just, yeah, she and I, uh, clinged right there and uh, so i i was pretty set on on long to her what color was her collar just out of curiosity uh so she was the red collar yeah, yeah. nice nice so and there's different there. selections if you want a, a working dog you're looking for certain specific things aren't you well yeah that's what was neat you know um I'm, I'll, i remember one of the processes uh it's kind of funny because she's kind of changed to be opposite now but um we dropped a a uh basically a dog bull in the area the vicinity of the dog nothing like you know crazy to scare but but enough to startle the dog you know the dog's not um doesn't know know what's coming necessarily and drops it in the area and then uh it was funny because we were looking you know see how startled the dog would it would be and would it come back to investigate what had happened and uh Moxie, of course, came running right back. So it was like, oh, this is great. And uh, now she's afraid if her tail hits a leaf on a tree that she's not expecting. So it's kind of funny that that, you know, it, all those tests and then, uh, yeah, that one in particular, I feel like it's just funny because she's now afraid of her own shadow. So. Yeah. She, <laughs> uh, but, but it was a great – yeah. Yeah, she's done that on other things too. Like uh, I wanted to tell everybody about her experience – with trying to learn how to swim because I was there for some of that, which again, we've gone total opposites, haven't we, Eric? I mean, when we tried to get her to swim up at uh, first Lake, I mean, that was, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, she it's, was uh, water. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you, you know, I always, I've always had that stigma of uh, labs just, you know, loves the water and, you know, uh, like I said, never really raising a dog uh, in adulthood here. So, uh, was my first. So whenever, um, yeah, whenever we, we started her around the water plenty, uh, between the house and, um, the first time she went in the water was while we were canoeing as a puppy. So she decided to jump right in and maybe that deterred her from kind of wanting to get into it more. I don't know. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I tried everything. I tried being in a canoe in the pond, you know, trying to coax her with her toy, um, and ultimately we were up at a, a family camp in, uh, in, in Maine and there, uh, Mary's cousin's dog was there and, uh, we were coaxing Moxie trying to get her to go. And so the other dog was swimming, swimming like crazy. And eventually she, she jumped right in and chased after the, the ball or stick, whatever we were throwing. And, and uh, since then, now it's like she's got radar for wherever a <laughs> mud puddle might be, uh, you know, the most ugly, you know, grossest water you could find uh, or what have you. And that yellow lab turns into a black lab pretty quick. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's a blessing and a curse. So she loves the water and it's uh, it's great. Yesterday we were on a search and – I swear, as soon as she's got at all a feeling that she needs to cool down, it's, it's I'm going to run to the stream that, of course, is right beside our search area and cool down, which in the end, it kind of works out good because she cools down and gets back focused. But, um, but yeah, she's got a straight line, line of sight on any water body when we're out in the boat. Um, no, that, that's, that's just too funny. And, uh, yeah, uh, this being there and seeing her that first time you tried so hard to get her in the water, back and forth, back and forth, tossing it just beyond her reach, and she would not, would not go in the water. And to see her now, talk about opposites, it's, it's just a huge change, that dog. And Eric has a pond at his house in the backyard, and as soon as he lets the dog out, and he's like, don't jump in the pond! Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's where the dog heads, yeah. that pond. <laughs> Yeah, at least it's not a say, she's got, yes yes at least that's the only nice thing i leave uh i leave a towel on the porch because every <laughs> night after work i open my cruiser door and she just goes straight to the pond jumps in and then comes to the porch so about the time that i'm got all my gear out of my cruiser to bring into the house she's coming 
soaking wet, and uh, so I dry her off and bring her in. <laughs> oh, and that can her her work day. <laughs> yeah. and, and Moxie's got a sister at home, right? Yeah, yeah. So I've got uh, her sister Millie, so an Australian Shepherd, uh, and um, so we uh, we uh, we got her not long after getting Moxie. So um, so she's uh, yeah about six months uh, less in age than Moxie. So mm -hmm. and they get along well. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So any uh, yeah, they're they're uh, they've been together since and. Um, Geez, they're just yeah. They they uh, certainly love each other and uh, play in every aspect that you'd think two sisters would play, uh, as far as chasing each other around the yard and everything. And um, but yeah, they're they're uh, pretty inseparable. So that's great. So your training, I mean, you, it's it's a lot of training, especially when you start from a puppy, because you have that puppy time, and then uh, we've been talking to. Uh, James Benvenuti and Billy Boudreau and talking about going to Vermont for six weeks. And for you being as remote as you are, you just add some hours of traveling and uh, just to get to the Vermont Academy, how long does that take you? Yeah. So it's three, uh, three and a half one way for me to get to the Academy. So on a, a training day, I'll be seven hours of driving and usually a mixed stop somewhere in there. Well, that's a lot of commitment. Yeah. Oh, but, and that's what being a canine handler is. It's commitment, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. That's the, uh, that's the one thing, uh, you know, that with work on a given day, yeah, you can be done hopefully at, the, at some point. And uh, with, with the canine handling, you're kind of always have some aspect of responsibility with work, uh, you know, every day with her. So, mm. so your first find with Moxie. And can you share that with us or one of your, your big cases that you, you've put together using Moxie? Because I know as officers, we all love bringing a canine in to help us because they are so much faster, more efficient and find us evidence and we can put cases together, find people, you know, and that's what our team's all about. And uh, just share, because I know that's kind of, you get those special moments with your dog when you put all that effort into it and then you get a yeah. reward. Yeah, so it's kind of neat. The one that jumps right to mind was, yeah, my first find with Moxie would have been at a hunter-related shooting that occurred uh, down at Millsfield. So um, basically got the call the night before that, hey, we need you down here. We're going to go into the scene. Um, so uh, got down with Sergeant Lucas and uh, CO Jim Sears, and they had investigated uh, the night before, and, and again, we were there to – kind of do, do the scene work wrap up that day. Um, so uh, the, the shell casings were, um, it ended up being a shotgun related incident. Um, so the shell casings were visible, but certainly a great aspect to train and, and utilize Moxie on. Um, so located those, um, you know, a lot of physical evidence at the scene with, with the location of this being a real thick area um, involving hair hunters. Um, so from there, a uh, lot of, lot was going on on scene. I, I worked Moxie out the, basically the trajectory that that, uh, shot, uh, or shots took place at and, uh, basically trying to locate the, the wads or any other related shot, uh, piece, um, out in that vicinity. Um, you know, Moxie is fresh out of the academy at this point, so we we ran that trajectory. But again, a lot of distractions and stuff going on at the scene. So um, I put her up back in the cruiser, and uh, we wrapped up all the all the work with that with that line in in the scene with with the COs there. And uh, once that was complete, I decided to bring Moxie back in uh, for a, a second sweep of the area. Um, and this was just she and I in that, in that scene. So, uh, it was kind of, it was really neat actually. So I, I worked out that trajectory and, uh, and spun back. This would have been the, the, uh, you know, one of the sides of that line in, in working back, uh, we literally were probably, let's say 30 feet from, uh, off of the trajectory line and, uh, Moxie starts getting 
getting uh, birdie on something. So she's she's got a change in behavior and and ultimately down. So excited, her um, tail's wagging, and you're, you're oh yeah, I can just see the something. nose. Yep, yep. And uh, and I'm a little ways from her at this point, and it's real thick, you know, thick fur, just nasty stuff. And um, so sure enough, she downs on something, and I could see this this red, uh, I believe it was red wad, uh, that was in, in amongst the, um, in amongst the leaves and, and stuff at the base of one of these firs. And, uh, it was so exciting because it was a spot that you wouldn't have necessarily looked back at, uh, almost as if it had deflected off of one of the trees and bounced back towards the shooter. Uh, so it was a really neat, you know, neat first find. Um, and, uh, so I was ecstatic. Uh, spun back in literally uh, on the other side of that trajectory line, located uh, an additional uh, wad um, that was only, in that case, I think 10 feet or so off of the trajectory line. Um, in any case, you know, three of us had been in there, uh, to, you know, a fourth to include Moxie. Uh, we hadn't initially located that those pieces of evidence, and they um, – Certainly weren't they weren't extremely valuable in this case, uh, but they were a nice piece to put together for for the investigating COs. Yeah, and safe to say that you guys would have never found that evidence if it wasn't for Moxie. Oh no! In in that you know that color of that water, it, they they blended in so well. I, I it was kind of neat. I took some photos once Moxie down and stuff. I played with her. Um, and, uh, when I took photos of that, it's almost hard. To, it's hard to see in the photos that I'm taking from, you know, let's say my height, you know, whatever, where my hands are five feet away or so, uh, they blended in very well. Yeah. No. So when you got Moxie there with you right now? Oh yeah. Yeah. She, she's sleeping. She's sleeping. That's what she does best, right? <laughs> <laughs> You got to sleep when it's time to sleep and you got to work when it's time to work. That's, uh, that's what talks to. <laughs> You're going to say hi. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, she, uh, yeah, she was in the cruiser for a long time yesterday. So I think she's, she had her morning, her breakfast and now she's in her morning nap routine. So great. So, well, great, Eric. I really appreciate you. Um, is there something you want to say about Moxie that not a lot of people know about? Um, I think we got into some of her personality, but the, the water thing, but, you know, a little tidbit that maybe is a little funny or something unique. Uh, yeah, she, uh, oh, I'm trying to think her, you know, her swimming habits, probably the biggest thing. Um, but she is uh, absolutely a lab in every aspect when it comes to food. Um, so if I haven't fed her by the designated to the team minute of every day, it, it ends up being that, that sit and stare from, I, it could be 15 feet away. It could be like two feet away and she just sits and stares and, and she won't leave your side until you've gone downstairs and filled her dog bowl. So, um, yeah, I would say it's uh, that would be another funny aspect of her. I mean, she's it's like she knows the clock's ticking. And she's going to fade away if I don't get her her meal, for, her second meal for the day, her first meal. So. And does she still attack the food like she used to? I mean, literally, when she was a puppy, I've never seen a dog like that, just ferociously attacking. Oh, yeah. I get that. So, yeah, I can go get this thing. Uh, we end up, we got a bowl that has essentially a maze through the whole thing. And, um, you know, our first, the first, yeah, couple of weeks having her, um, even as a puppy, it was just, it was obscene how quick she'd eat. So, um, in an effort to slow her down and, uh, um, you know, make it a reasonable breakfast and dinner, we got her this bowl that's, it's, it, again, it's just got all kinds of crevices through it. So, um, she has to, it, instead of it taking 30 seconds for her to eat her meal, it, it, at least takes two minutes so uh it's a it's a little better <laughs> yeah yeah and sometimes you know uh dogs take on attributes of their owners and i'll say that so. oh, oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm wondering if that, in, your, in your cupboard is there a maze filled bowl <laughs> yeah. well yeah that that uh, <laughs> uh <yeah. laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, but uh, that, that's great. And th- thanks so much, Eric, for taking a little time to, you know, you know, bring some reality to the, the 4-H dog clubs um, and doing this for Ruby as well. And certainly, uh, you know, the kids uh, get inspired by you guys and seeing how dogs work and how you guys train. And then they bring that home to, to train and hopefully next year we'll be in better condition to, you know, compete and at the fairs and such like that. So um, thanks a lot right. for taking your time. Yeah, well, I'm I'm uh, yeah honored to be a part of it and uh, appreciate the opportunity, Wayne. And yeah, don't let uh, for those four H's. Don't let this you know discourage you. Uh, there's still you know even with us with training you know remotely and and not getting together, we've kind of been spinning it on our own with uh, and, and coming up with different different ideas on on how to train. So I think in the end, if it, if you can make something better from it and and come up with some new new ideas on training, that's a positive too. So. Awesome. No, thanks for that tidbit too. Appreciate it. So we're following up our third interview for this segment is a little different, a little different, but it's, it's pretty cool. You guys are going to get the insight into the future of the New Hampshire canine program. And we have with us right now, uh, Ken St. Pierre officer, conservation officer, game warden, Ken St. Pierre, who is stationed in the lakes region area And you might have seen him on Northwoods Law as well, but he is the newest member of the canine team, huh, Ken? Yeah, that's right, Wayne. Um, I just got on the team here in April. Um, Don't have a dog yet, but we're looking to get one in September. And, you know, I'm kind of doing my reading up, doing my studying and trying to help out the rest of the guys as much as I can where I'm at right now. So even dogless, you are part of the team, aren't you? They're making you run tracks, aren't they? Yeah. Oh yeah. I, uh, I get plenty of workout, you know, I, I got to run tracks for, for Bob and, and James and Cora and Ruger and, um, Moxie. So I'm out there running tracks. They're coming to find me. Um, but it's, it's a good, it's a good learning opportunity for me because, you know, while I'm sitting there waiting, I can watch them from a ways off and, you know, really kind of focus on the dog and see what the dog's doing. And I'm starting to pick up different things and kind of learn, you know, what to look for and, you know, how to read these dogs. And I mean, my dog's going to be complete, could be completely different. I could have completely different cues and you don't know, but um, just knowing what to look for is definitely going to be a big help. Yeah. And for those that don't know, when you lay a track, uh, a person lays a track, they usually start at a certain location. So the handler knows, and then he basically walks in the woods and makes how many turns how many this how many that and then the dog follows them there's a time frame in between too it's like an hour two hours depending depending the track and uh, are you laying short tracks long tracks or up to a mile or well when you lay a track um, out ken what do you have what are they having you do most days it's been right around a half a mile um you know walk for 10 15 minutes and you know try to try to make it not super difficult but you know obviously throw in turns throw in um, maybe some cross contamination stuff um, as far as trying to you know cross a hiking trail something like that so the dog has to get to these other scents and you know kind of figure out um, which one he's actually following and you know pick me out of the group and then keep going so it's it's you want it to be challenging for the dog but not um, not impossible because when you're training you never want you never want a failure. You always want to, you know, you always want that success at the end of a training. That way they get that, they get that praise at the end and they get that good job. So we, uh, we try, we challenge them, but we, we don't make them fail. Yeah. It sounds like you're already learning and that, that's, that's great that they bring you into this dog list to start the process. Cause even when you have a dog, I mean, tr- you guys as handlers are always laying tracks for each other and cross training with each other, with each other's dogs, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually good. I mean, I live in a pretty central location for the, the canine team. Um, James and Cora are 20 minutes to my South. So anytime I need to meet up with them or we want to work together, it's not, uh, not too hard to do. Bob and Ruger are fairly close as well. They're an hour. Um, Eric and Moxie, they're, they're the furthest ones away. So that, that'll be a little bit tricky, but I mean, we still, we train every, you know, every Monday we have, that's kind of our set schedule is, you know, Mondays are training days. So 
we meet up somewhere in the state and just hang out, train the dogs and make sure everyone's in top shape. Nope. That's, that's really cool. So, and you're going to get a dog from West Reed, like, uh, so many of the others have as well, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Wes is, uh, yeah, I mean, he puts out great dogs. He puts out awesome dogs for us. Um, and we're looking for, uh, September. He's going to have, supposedly there's going to be a litter, um, coming in mid July. And then, you know, after eight weeks, they'll, they'll be able to come home. So mid September, it looks like it's going to be the time to really get, you know, all four paws on the ground and start working a lot harder. Yeah, and Wes just put a comment on uh, the Warden's Watch uh, Facebook page that that, you know, should be have puppies on the ground mid-July and on the same schedule, so it sounds pretty good. But you may be looking for a different kind of lab, huh? Yeah, so this this next uh, litter is going to be a, Wes said it's going to be a black and chocolate lab. So, I mean, we've never had a chocolate lab before. We've uh, got blacks and we've got uh, the yellow, so... Maybe, maybe we'll have a chocolate that will meet our needs and, you know, pass all the testing that we do. And maybe at the end, we'll be picking a, a chocolate this time. I think that would be really awesome to have all the colors of labs representative. There is a yeah. golden, although Moxie can go yellow or golden, I think. So, um, but you know, we can get all those colors represented that that would be a quite a team. So yeah. any, any ideas on names yet? You've been kicking those around? Yeah, so I've been kicking them around and thinking. Um, I, right now, I, I think I'm down to two. Um, I struggled a little bit with a male name, um, but for a female name, I'm at Winnie. Um, I live right here in the Lakes region. I've got Lake Winnipesaukee is in my patrol. It's a big part of my patrol. It's a big part of the state. I mean, it's the biggest water body in the state. Everyone who comes to New Hampshire knows, you know, Lake Winnipesaukee. So. Everyone calls it Winnie for short, so that was a, a female name that I picked out, and I'm, everyone I've talked to really likes it and, you know, really likes everything that goes behind it. And uh, the male name took a little while. Um, I think it actually came from Chad Elliott, one of our, our fish culturists at one of our hatchery, um, but uh, I'm also on the dive team, and, you know, on our feet, they're not flippers, they're fins. So, um, for the, the male name, I'm looking at Finn. Um, just, I think that's a, I think it's a pretty good fit. It's, it's still a, a pretty strong name as far as commands and things like that. So I think right now we're in between, uh, Winnie and Finn. It just depends on, on, uh, the sex of the dog. Uh, well this, we're incorporating the 4-H kids into this, the 4-H uh, dog groups. Would it be okay if they like commented on the Warden's Watch Facebook page and threw some names out with you and you might like something better or? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's, uh, like I said, I don't have the dog yet, so we've got a couple months. Um, but there's, I've kind of been kind of putting it out to everybody, you know, if you can think of something good, shoot, shoot me a text, you know, Facebook, whatever. Um, because... I can only think of so much and I've only got enough uh, brain power to think of dog names for so long. So um, yes. having other people's input definitely helps. Yeah. The 4-H kids could throw out a name for a lab, potentially a chocolate lab out on the Facebook page and uh, just uh, give you some ideas. I think that would be good interaction, good ideas. And you, maybe you stick with your originals, but I got a few ideas for you, Ken. I mean, you're, you're a maple syrup guy, huh? You have a small maple syrup business called Big Lake Maple, huh? Yeah, yeah, I've uh, I've been making maple syrup for five years now. We just finished up our fifth season, um, and then this past year, I actually made an LLC, uh, Big Lake Maple. Once again, I grew up in Lakes Region, um, right next to Lake Winnipesaukee. Uh, you know, everyone refers it to refers to it as the Big Lake. You know, let's hey, where are you going fishing? Oh, we're gonna go up to the Big Lake. So in my mind, I'm like, hey, I'm right here. The lake's two miles away. Big Lake Maple. Um, Luckily, it wasn't taken, so I put the uh, put the LLC on it, and now I'm legitimate. Cool, and yeah, I'm thinking, you know, with Big Lake Maple part of you, Lake would be a really cool uh, male name, and Maple. If you had a chocolate lab, it's kind of mapley. Some dark syrup there can be, yeah. you know, kind of mapley. So I think, uh, yeah, writing your own uh, 
right in your own uh, name you have two there lake uh, for a dog and uh, maple for a female so that those are those are my ideas see if the kids can beat them so yeah uh, no i have uh, i've definitely tossed around that idea too um right now i'm currently dogless i don't have a dog at <laughs> home at all oh um, that's right you just lost your dog didn't you yeah yeah i had to put her down in uh december um she would have been seven this year but things happen. It, it is what it is. Um, uh, made, made the decision before it got real bad. So, uh, we, we had to do that, but right now I'm dogless and, you know, I, I want two dogs would be nice. So I was thinking, you know, in the future, if I get another dog, um, that, I, that would kind of go into the maple, the maple aspect. Um, mm-hmm. but who knows, who knows if someone can come up with something better than me, then by yeah. all means, by and you never means. know how names will hit you because sometimes they just uh they're just there though so, and they, yep. they they fit and you're like why did i think of that but that would be I yep, think a good, exactly a good thing for the kids to do to have some interaction with you and throw out some names and uh see what they come up with so and we've stirred their thoughts already i think so doing that yeah. so i think uh yeah it's pretty awesome that you're getting involved with the canine team now and uh, getting your dog and uh two dogs isn't bad we talked to eric fluette who has two dogs in the house and it seems like that works well together so uh maybe yep. uh, the kids can help you with that 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 second name of that second dog because uh i think it's a lot easier on you when there's uh two dogs around too they can play together they keep each other entertained and i've noticed that yeah. at my house too when my son got his new dog that it probably added years onto my german shepherd so just a yep. totally different feeling so and he was totally acting different so i think that that's pretty cool so well thank you so much for joining us and giving us uh a preview into what's ahead for the new hampshire uh canine and i hope we get to i hope northwoods law gets an opportunity to cover picking that puppy much like they did moxie and going through that process because uh i think that was pretty fun for everybody to to see that on tv and be a part of that and i think think it'll be pretty awesome if we can do the same with you ken yeah that would be it would definitely be uh it would definitely be good um i know i mean i know when i enjoyed watching eric you know go through the steps and go through being able to pick his dog and you know just seeing that that pure joy and reaction and you know seeing how how awesome it was um unfortunately with the way things are right now um who knows what what uh, the circumstances will be in September, but you know, we can only hope for the best and Absolutely. hopefully something, something good comes out of it. Well, thanks for joining Warden's Watch and, and giving us all that information and interacting with the 4-H kids so they can uh, throw out some names there for you. And uh, appreciate all you do for the citizens of New Hampshire, man. That, that's good. It's an yep. awesome, awesome job. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. Don't be a, don't be a stranger. We always got, always got good stuff going on. No doubt. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Wayne. And now I'm with Conservation Officer Bob Mancini and Canine Ruger. And Bob is our most senior member to the team. Ruger's our most senior dog with a little uh, sabbatical there in between, huh, Bob? Uh, but, yeah. but Ruger uh, was stayed with you and you stayed up to, to currents when you took a little sabbatical there. But just want to talk about uh you have the most tenure as far as it goes on the new hampshire fishing game canine team for sure you know you trained with mark hensel initially and uh ruger is our most senior dog at what did you say so you'll be eight in october i can't believe it yeah goes quick is is that old for a working dog uh um so ideally you want to you want to work a dog in their prime when they're going to be most like my heat alarms going off right now for him actually uh you want to work a dog in their prime in there yeah i'm gonna just check on him real quick so bob's uh, just checking he's sitting in his cruiser and if you're on patreon you can actually see this video um he just went out and checked uh ruger real quick and uh now he's back in the saddle again yeah he's back nine ruger right beside uh Conservation Good officer, boy. game Good warden, uh, Bob Mancini. He's got a little gray around his uh, lips there. Huh, Bob, giving you a kiss there. <laughs> we, we match. We both got you some gray hairs. Gray. I think. <laughs> yeah. We gave him – I don't know who gave him to who, but we got him. So we're working yeah. with it. But, yeah, he's going to be 8 in October. And, fortunately, he's, he's very much in great condition. 
Uh, we really watch his diet. I should say the same about myself, but he, you know, he's on a regimented food and vitamin um, intake every day. It's all measured out. And that just keeps him uh, at the pinnacle of form. And so he can operate at a high level when needed. But um, yeah, he's a, uh, it's amazing. They don't forget anything. And we did have a little, little uh, sabbatical from fishing game for a couple of years, but um, we still maintained our training and that's really important. Uh, dogs, they love to work. They love to please. And for him, he's very much toy driven. So we utilize that toy and some food along the way to get him to really want to want to perform at a high level. And th fortunately it's worked out that way. Yeah, I think he's a little love driven too. I saw that little kiss he gave you. So uh, <laughs> yeah. it was pretty happy yeah. you checked on him. <laughs> and you've had Ruger yeah. since what, 11 weeks, you said? 11 weeks old. So yeah, we, we got him. Um, he was just a little puppy and a little ball of black fur. And I, I guess I would have never imagined how, how amazing it would be and, and fulfilling it is to have a canine partner there they're much more than just a partner, you know, he becomes a member of the family. Really for me, it was kind of um, my first crack at being, uh, you know, having to care for somebody other than myself. So that's been, that's been very helpful now that I have two little, little kids and James and, and Ava Grace. So he's, he's, he's kind of my Guinea pig and uh, I, I love having him. The missions that we get called to are, have been, really incredible a lot a lot of fun extremely rewarding finding people is is exhilarating whether it's a criminal or a missing person somebody who's dead or alive it's it's probably the most exhilarating thing that you can experience in a in the realm of search and rescue as a as a volunteer or or any type of participant uh, and then evidence is second um, i love finding evidence whether it's a in relate in relation to a homicide or officer involved shooting or even evidence to help us put together um, a wildlife crime all all of those things have been very very enjoyable can you give us a scenario may you know that really stands out in your mind where, whether it was a track or evidence or something really critical uh, one of those uh one of those stories bob of you and ruger doing their job well uh i guess we we can just kind of go to um a most recent one, which was really, really kind of neat, um, got called. I was in Twin Mountain patrolling and I heard over the radio of a, of a juvenile that, you know, had some suicidal tendencies and had, had fled her residence. And it's just uh, one of those cases of being at the right, you know, right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got on the radio, I said I was in the area and uh, we responded and when I get out of the truck, I always meet with the officer on scene to try to get an idea of what's going on, what am I looking for. And um, from the time that I got out of my truck, I hit, I hit my, I have an app on my phone and um, it'll, it records a track and I also record a track on the GPS. But from the time I started my track and arrived on scene to the time that we located this missing juvenile was under 10 minutes and she was a half mile from her residence. So it was pretty much a, a dead, you know, a very quick, brisk walk or a slow jog the entire time through the woods, across brooks, open fields, back into thick woods and down into a really steep drainage and Ruger found her. So what I like to say about canines and, and handlers is that they, they essentially are um, a force multiplier. If we were to have to go and search for this this female who had who had taken a lot of uh, medication was it was in real uh, dire straits as far as you know gonna gonna be passing out at some point and not be uh, responsive. So if we were to put officers and do a foot search on the ground, that could have taken hours to search that same half mile distance from the place last seen. And Ruger did it in ten minutes, and so. When I think of anything, I just think of dogs are really a force multiplier. We can show up on scene, we can search an entire field for a shell casing in minutes. That same officer might be out there with a, um, a metal detector walking, doing a grid search for hours to find the same piece, or maybe they don't find it at all. So 
in my in my experience, Ruger has just been a force multiplier. All of our canines in the entire division are are great dogs. They're excellent at evidence detection, excellent at um, at tracking and fish and wildlife detection. And it really comes down to the amount that our department allows us to train and um, the tools and equipment that we have at our disposal to to do our jobs effectively. Yeah, and uh, you know, we, we talk about your sabbatical. And I, that's something I, I just want to kind of get into because it just kind of tells you what kind of agency you work for. Because when you work as a team with a canine, technically the department owns the dog, correct? Yeah, so... I Ruger is he was he is um, a an employee for the department and he is a he's a piece of equipment owned by the department. The department purchased them um, and gave me the opportunity to work them as a handler, but very much is owned and taken care of by the department. And in 2017, I made a really difficult decision to to take another job um, as a chief in Sugar Hill, a very small town in um, the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And um, I remember having a, uh, a very candid conversation with Colonel Kevin Jordan at the time. And I said, you know, Colonel, if, if you say I can't take Ruger, then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stay because I don't want to leave the dog. And he's like, I could never take your dog. And so even though he didn't, no necessarily want to lose me as an employee he he wasn't gonna do you know get in the way of something that he thought that I wanted to do and um so they allowed me to keep Ruger uh after leaving and I was able to work him in Sugar Hill and he had several fines while we were a team in Sugar Hill but um it just didn't the amount of calls that I got in Sugar Hill didn't even compare to the amount of calls I got as a conservation officer with the fish and game department. We, we get called all over the state for a variety of issues. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be going down to a, a place in the lakes region to look for firearms uh, in related in relation to a big felony case. We get called to search for um, shell casings and, you know, homicides and stuff that I just wasn't getting a real chance to do um, working in the small town. Don't have as many resources and connections uh, the tracks were still there. We were getting called by the local departments that needed help finding criminals and missing people, which is great. But a lot of our, our calls are related to evidence detection. And Ruger's really, he's really pretty exceptional at it. So to not be able to use him um, for his intended purpose was, was troubling for me. And I, I didn't feel like I was, you know, fulfilling my, my own career. And uh, I just missed, missed the variety of being a conservation officer. It's it's a job that you can't compare to anywhere else unless you're in wildlife law enforcement somewhere around the country. You probably don't understand some of the things I'm talking about, but you just, there's, there's a lot of drive and a lot of personal pride that goes in, into being in wildlife law enforcement. You're working hours you don't get paid for um, in inclement weather all the time. And uh, you just, you make the best of it cause it's fun. It's an adventure. Every day is an adventure. And I love that. I, d I did too, Bob, and I we're very happy to have you Ruger back. It just uh, it just says so much for our department and the Colonel to to have let you gone with your dog, though, because you're a team. You're it's a partnership. It's uh, yeah, to take a man from his dog. I mean, we've heard stories of that happening in the military and other agencies, and it just uh, it and that's why I wanted to bring it up because it speaks volumes of the, the department that I work for that you work for. And I just, uh, I just appreciated that knowing the bond between man and dog or woman and dog and having that done for you and Ruger and then to have you back. It's, 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 it's really an awesome thing. So very happy, but there's some other things that I have, you know, I've talked to most of the guys on the team and Ken St. Pierre who's going to be one of your team members coming up. And uh, Kevin, Lieutenant, uh, yeah, Colonel Kevin Jordan's gonna gonna wrap this up at the end too. Uh, we're gonna interview him a little bit later, and uh, and I'm gonna probably ask him. We all have labs. Any idea why we went to labs, or can you kind of explain that, or it was was that specific to fishing game, or what do you what are your thoughts on just you know laboratory retrievers and being partners with us? So I I don't. First, I'll say is that any working dog that can accomplish the job that it's required to do is the right dog. So 
if you if you can have um, a Malinois or a German Shepherd doing whatever job it is that you're looking to do in a law enforcement capacity, then then that's the right dog for us. We do a lot of community policing. Uh, we are out checking licenses. We're out on, you know, boat launches, snowmobile trails, ATV trails. A lot of what we do is educating the public and wanting to be approachable. And labs um, historically have been a, a very kind breed. They're, they tend not to be overly aggressive. Um, they tend to be um, very um, eager to please and kind of people friendly. We'll just go with that, the term people friendly. So not only that, that community policing piece, but they also are highly trainable and we had good standing with a couple other um, previous Labrador retrievers that were exceptional dogs that were um, that were handled by Mark Hensel, who is a who who is now a state trooper, and he ran our canine program for a long time. So Mark had very very good luck with Poacher and Sig, uh, both Labrador retrievers, and so we continued with that um, going with Labrador retrievers simply because we had we had really good luck with them being excellent dogs at the evidence detection, fish and wildlife detection and in scent discriminant tracking. So it's not to say that another dog couldn't do the job that we're doing. It's just, we've had really good luck and it's the, you know, the old, the old saying, um, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And so in our case, that's the case. We just, yep. that's a good it works fit. out and you know, maybe someday we will have, we'll have a different canine. We'll, maybe we'll have a hound who knows, but right now um, our dogs are, when you think of it too, we're, we're not running just a hound that's doing scent discrimination tracking. We're, we're running dogs that we're expecting them to be able to key in on, on a single human scent and follow it for miles. We're expecting them to be able to find gunpowder, uh, any type of human scent that's out of place in any location. And we're expecting them to be able to do fish and wildlife detection for turkey, venison, and fish. And so that's asking a lot of, out of a dog and you have to have a dog that's going to be able to, to do those things that you want it to do, which is multiple. There's multiple starting sequences. There's multiple trainings. Um, there's a lot to tighten up to make sure that the dog understands what you're asking of it and that you can testify in court to what the dog is telling you, because it's all about the handler reading the dog and the dog not getting miscued by the handler. It's a real team. Mostly, I'm the dummy on the end of the lead following Ruger. That's the honest. <laughs> but to get to that point it takes a hundreds of hours of training and a lot of, um, a lot of trust goes in, into play. Yeah, no doubt. That's, uh, that's pretty good. And you, you got Ruger kind of an odd way too. Um, Cause you wanted a canine really bad, didn't you, Bob? And you I went bad for that canine. I did. Let's I, share uh, that story because I love that story. <laughs> well, I, it says you know, a lot about you too. <laughs> it's a while ago, so there, there could be some some uh, authentic license here on my part. But what basically <laughs> we'll happened it. is um, I wanted a canine, and there wasn't enough funding to get another canine. Uh, Lieutenant B Bill Boudreaux had just got Ruby. Um, Mark Hensel had. SIG. So we had two canines and they're really, while there was a need for another dog, there wasn't the funding um, piece, which is always critically important in a self-funded agency. If you don't have the money and you can't acquire the money somehow, then certain things have to go without. It's just how it goes. It's nothing personal. It's a business and um, we have to go and get the things that are, are an absolute necessity and getting a dog at that time, a, a third dog wasn't, wasn't a, the, the primary necessity of the department. It was important. It was on the radar, but it wasn't the pinnacle. Mm. So I, I had a, a meeting down with Colonel Garabedian and then major Jordan and, um, I was told at that meeting that I wasn't going to be getting a dog and it was, and I, and I wanted to clarify as to why, you know, I wasn't getting a dog. Was it performance related? Was it because I was a young officer? And so 
probably questions that I shouldn't have asked hindsight 2020 because <laughs> it's um, really is none of my business. They said I wasn't going to get a dog. I shouldn't get a dog. So that's how it goes. But I, I asked, you know, as, as professionally as I could is, you know, is it because I'm not doing my job to your satisfaction? Is it because I'm a young officer? No, Bob, that's not the case. No, Bob, that's not the case. Is it a money situation? Yes, it's a money situation. Okay. Well, what if I raise the money is what I, is that, is how I kind of phrased the question. And I got a bit of a, you know, kind of a bewildered look by Colonel Garabedi and he was, he was kind of trying to figure me out a little bit and I kind of phrased it again. And I was like, what if I go ahead and raise the money? What's the, what's the cost to have the dog and how much are you looking for me to raise? And, and if I raise that amount, can I get one? And so the number was thrown out. It's about $2,000 a year for a canine back then. And um, we're going to need several years of funding to get it. So if you raise, you know, $8,000, then uh, you can go ahead and get a dog. So I said, well, um, I'm going to raise that money and I'll, I'll look forward to coming back and letting you know when I, how I do it. And so it, it didn't take me long <laughs> before I left the office. Our now Colonel Kevin Jordan looked at, Colonel Garabedian and said, uh, he's going to raise that money. You're going to have to get him a dog. And so they kind of chuckled back and forth, but I, that, that stayed with me because, um, there was some adversity there. Raising $8,000 is, Absolutely. is a lot of money. Um, it's a, it's a big task. It's a tall order, but, uh, I just, I went to bat and I, thankfully I had a little bit of a background working at Franklin Pierce university in the fundraising department. So had a little, little background with, um, go, going about writing, um, letters on how to acquire funds and basically asking for money. And, and I had to get permission to go ahead and do that, but, uh, it didn't take long and I had raised several thousand dollars. In fact, I, I think I got a thousand dollar, um, gift on my way home that day. So <laughs> that was, um, and I, I remember, I remember saying, yeah, I've, you know, I've only driven 90 miles and I already got a thousand dollars on our way. And, uh, I, thankfully I hit up, um, a bunch of local banks in the Littleton area and some of the other local businesses and, and some really, really, um, really supportive members of the community. And again, with, with everybody's help, it, we, I ended up raising well over, that amount of money. I don't know exactly how much, but it probably over the course of time in the 15 or $20,000 range now. Yeah. And you even named your dog in hopes of raising some more money, didn't you? We did. Yeah. I named him Ruger because I thought that that would be a good selling point. It turns out that Ruger did donate to the department in a different way um, through becoming an outdoors woman. So I thought that that was that was a, you know, definitely a, a good thing, no matter what, even though it didn't come directly to the canine program, it still helped out the department immensely. And um, so everybody in our, in our agency helps uh, each other, the different divisions of the department uh, work hand in hand to do a good job and serve the people in New Hampshire. So naming Ruger after, uh, you know, Sturm Ruger firearms is, is something I'm proud of. And I have quite a few in my gun cabinet at home. And I'm hoping they get a hold of this podcast and someone working for Ruger is going to listen to this and say, hey, we should donate to the New Hampshire canine, uh, uh, New Hampshire Fishing Game canine program through the Wildlife Heritage Foundation, who does all the fundraising and everything. And the whole canine program is pretty much dependent on that fundraising now. So my hope is someone at Ruger listens to this and they're like, geez, that's, that's something we should uh, contribute to since uh, eight-year-old Ruger you know, has been around for a long time doing a lot of advertising for us. And uh, hopefully we can uh, be a team member and pull our weight. <laughs> well, that would, that would all be great. And, um, you know, yeah. fingers crossed, the fingers crossed if it happens, but no matter what, you know, Ruger's had a, he's had a great career. We're going to continue to have a good mm -hmm. career. He's had a lot of, a lot of fines over the years. Um, both people that are alive, you know, old, young, um, some, some have, you know, been dead, a um, lot of evidence finds. And so it's been a very worthwhile career. I'm very lucky to have been paired with him. Uh, Mark Hensel did a great job picking him out out of all the other dogs that we could have selected. And thankfully I got Ruger. So yeah, it's been awesome. Just, is he right there? Can you have him come up again? Yeah. Last Ruger. time. 
Just say hi doing? to all the people watching the video. What are you doing, big fella? Yeah, there he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there he is. It's way too so, much loving. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great stuff. We spend, you know, it's so funny. My wife, my wife will say every once in a while, I swear to God, you love that dog more than me. I never answer her. I'm not going to answer her today either. Not going to answer, not going to answer that question. But I love my dog. I love my partner. He never yells at me. He always, uh, always you know, in the backseat ready for, to help you. Yeah. Yep. It's always in my corner. So, well, we're not. Thanks so much, Bob, for uh, sharing. And I, I didn't tell you, but first, and I know we've discussed off air, but basically the New Hampshire 4-H dog clubs are due to COVID. We're doing this distance learning, which, you know, they're going to be listening to this podcast. So that's part of it because they're training at a young age, teaching their dogs obedience, teaching their dogs confirmation, which is like fitting in showmanship, learning about dogs, study, quiz bowls, and they compete. And, and this year, you know, it's just kind of a downer. So, they're going to be uh, listening to this and answering some questions. And it's kind of a good way to start young people in the love of dogs. So uh, we're doing those and we're dedicating this uh, podcast to memory of Ruby that uh, Bill just lost his, his canine there. So uh, doing that in her memory, so it's just a, a great thing to do all the way around. And uh, thank you for participating in and making it special for, for all of those groups and, and our listeners. My pleasure. Yeah. Working a dog, training a dog is a monumental effort and starting somebody young to understand exactly what goes into it, I think is a, is a really, um, it's, a, it's critically important because you, you know, getting a dog is the easy part, but getting them to do what you want them to do takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and it is worth it. No matter what, even if you have a bad day, try to, try to make it end on a positive because the dogs remember. I'll leave you with that. The dogs always remember, so try to make it fun. And they want, want their relationship just like you and Ruger. So yeah. thanks. Yes. <laughs> Thank, thanks again for having me. And uh, good, good luck to everybody out there that's listening and, and going to be training their dogs for the upcoming 4-H season. And good luck. It's, a, it's the best thing you can ever do. And we are going to conclude this canine, New Hampshire canine fishing game podcast with Colonel Kevin Jordan. And the Colonel's joining me right now. And it seems like a good way to conclude it, Colonel, is wrapping up the, the ins and the outs, the, the behind the scenes of the, the canine of New Hampshire fishing game to, to bring you in it. And you're a longtime dog lover too. That, that's pretty evident. I've always seen that. And uh, you've had quite a bit of experience with dogs in your career and you love this program, don't you, Colonel? I do very much. Yeah, you're right. As far as uh, ever since I was a kid, I love dogs. I always had hunting dogs. I always had hounds, beagles and hounds. And, uh, and then, transitioned into shepherds when I was a teenager and and uh, it's funny that I ended up at at one point in my lifetime I had a Pomeranian that I don't share with everybody uh, his name I, is I, remember, I remember him very well so. yeah well you had you you had to arrive one day when we were kind of trying to figure out uh, Shelby and I who ran the house <laughs> a gallant battle but of course lost and uh, we were we were actually friends ever since and it was, uh, it was comical because, I, unfortunately, I ended up getting a divorce, and he was what I got out of the divorce. So he ended up coming with me, which was a bit unique. And he spent another uh, five great years with me, and we, we became very close. Because he, at the end of the day, you know, all of the dogs are the same. They've got great personalities. They're individuals, just like people. I'll take them over people, quite frankly, any day. Um, <laughs> but he, he, had his, uh, he had his faults and his strengths, and I miss him to this day. So... You're right. I love dogs. So it was a no brainer for me to have canines in this group. And you actually were one of the, well, there was, a, there was a history of officers before you, but I think you opened the door for what we could do with a good tracking dog. And you did that long before this program was here. Um, and so I also got a chance in the, when I worked in the field to see the advantage of having a good tracking dog and what it would do for us. And uh, it is a pretty tremendous act. Uh, uh, asset to have that in the field and I happen to we happen to have three of the best in the country so mm. and quite frankly agencies within our state have had to admit that and they, even agencies that have dogs their own dogs have called upon our dogs uh, when 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 it mattered so they recognize it too so yeah they're they're incredible I'd like to have twice what we have 
and the goal is to increase that. But right now we've got some good ones. So and some good, really good K9 handlers, guys that are devoted to it and have worked hard. Great. I'm, I'm going to step back because I want to tell everybody the story about Shelby. That's, yeah, uh, sure. that's pretty interesting. I remember we, we had to go to court that day and uh, I got to your front door and I opened the door. As I was opening the door, you said, don't open the door. And here comes Shelby prancing out the door. And you yeah, were none too happy. And you went prancing out after she went around the garage prancing or him. Sorry. <laughs> and you went around yeah, the garage after her, and she he came right back up the the stairs I opened the door and he pranced right back in the door and then you guys had a set to in which he pooped on you <laughs> yeah so what he what he did just to, just to save his reputation a little <laughs> what he did was back then he didn't we when we left the home when we left the house he had to put him in a kennel and he didn't like that and yeah. so decided that day he was going to take a stand and he was not going to go in a kennel so I'm I'm in a dress uniform because I'm about to prosecute one of your really poor cases in court, <laughs> which I did for you on a regular basis. And, yes, and so you were there to meet me. And we we're both in dress uniforms, and I'm chasing this dog all through the house trying to get him into a kennel so we don't become late. And he's in the kitchen running just as you open the door, and out he went. You're right. And and so he comes back into the house, and he made the fatal error, very similar to a pursuit on the highway where where the defendant picks a dead end road. He picked a dead end, dead end hallway. And so he decided to stand his ground at the end of that. So I put on gloves and because uh, I knew this was going to not be a, a good ending. And I walked down the hall and grabbed him. And it was like picking up the Tasmanian devil. It looked like a Tasmanian devil. <laughs> yeah, he uncorked. I had no idea a dog that small could be that vicious. And yeah. ended up, it was so bad. He, uh, he lost control of his bowels. It was awful. And, uh, we, and, of course, I'm mad now because I have a dress uniform with with Pomeranian <laughs> all over it. So I got to change. I'm definitely going to be late for court and I'm just bad at this dog in general. And uh, so after that day, once we established who the boss was, uh, we got along pretty well after that day. And he never did that again. That was the only time I ever saw that, but it was a high old. It was like picking up a rabid coon, quite frankly. <laughs> That's a good description. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I saw. But yeah, yeah. And you, you, yeah, that dog went with you everywhere after that he driving did. around in your truck he always did. there hanging out the window oh, yeah. just uh, yeah he rode the jeep he loved i had a jeep with no roof he loved you know i take the roof off in the summer and he loved it and uh, we'd go to dunkin donuts get a coffee every day he'd get a donut hole and he became quite a good friend which was kind of ironic because when he was brought home he would not i always had hunting dogs i never had a dog like that and that was clearly a lap dog um <laughs> and, uh, but i was not ashamed of him because he he ended up becoming, he and I became very close for a number of reasons. And uh, I was glad he was with me uh, until, he, until we lost him. And we lost him. He, he was healthy right up until three days before he passed. And he, his kidneys failed. And I just couldn't watch him suffer. He was too great of a dog. So I took him down and we did the honorable thing. But it was a, I can tell you, it was, one of the, it was a tough day to say goodbye to that little guy. So, and, yeah, uh, and I, we're dedicating this podcast actually to ruby because bill lost his canine ruby that's right um, yeah so that's that's our dedication to this whole canine podcast is ruby and uh, bill's loss and bill started this off and yeah she was a dynamic dog and i know you always require the guy canine guys to bring their dogs into the office you, you want to see them if they're there they, they got to bring their dogs oh yeah if they leave those dogs in the truck it's it's pretty well known now if those dogs are left in the truck uh, lisa the office manager uh, will condemn them uh, forever and they will go back out to the truck and bring those dogs in and even in training I said they're part of the family here so go get them bring them in. oh they'll jump all over everybody I said yeah and everybody here will survive that so they don't do that they are very well mannered they're good dogs and I want them here with us and so I insisted that Ruby had her own personality too she was full of energy and full of life she really was one of our first shining dogs if you remember she would do things that for us that no other canine had ever done. Uh, and she really paved the way or made me personally understand and realize that this was a good decision. This could work for New Hampshire Fish and Game and we should pursue this. And she is responsible. I'll always look back at Ruby as the little dog who sold us on that program because she showed us what she could do. Uh, I assembled, <laughs> to, just to tell you another funny story, I, when, we, when we lost her, I was texting Lieutenant Woodrow, Bill, asking him how she was doing. We were going to the vets, and he didn't answer me. 
So I called him up on the phone the day that he, he didn't, we made this tough decision and I could find, I discovered why he wasn't answering me. He couldn't even talk. And I said, Hey, I'll be right there. Immediately drove down to the, to the vets and saw her. I hadn't seen her in a while. She was really sick. And, and the decision was made. And I said, take her home bill so that the family could say goodbye to her and, and bring her back to the vets. We have a friend of ours that was the vet that really did some great things for us that day. So unknown to Bill, I called the K-19 and his district. And I said, listen, I, Bill won't want this, but I want us there at the, at the vets to be there when Bill arrives with Ruby in the morning. So he's not going through this. She's not going through this without all of us there. We'll be there to comfort Bill. And quite frankly, uh, the rest of us were trash. So I could have used 30 guys to comfort me. I couldn't stop crying when I saw her like that. And it was a hard day to walk in with Bill when we took her inside. So it was, she is and always will be uh, part of the fishing game family. And, uh, and that was a tough day for all of us. So, but it was kind of funny. We did that to help Bill and we all needed the help when we got there. <laughs> you know, there was probably seven or eight seasoned game wardens all crying like two-year-olds that day. So that was a tough day. And I'm hopeful that Bill, he stayed in the program and I'm personally hopeful that he will make the decision at some point to do it again because he did a great job. He is running the program and he does an outstanding job uh, running this K-19. So I, I kind of in, have encouraged him to stay there. Um, I, I think he does he does it justice and I like, I'd like to see him get another dog at some point. Wow, that says a lot. So yeah. we, we talked to uh, Bob Mancini about his little, uh, <laughs> you know, Ruger? Leaving and coming back with a uh, canine Ruger, another another indication, you know, Colonel, that uh, you are certainly a dog lover. A guy, you know, leaves the department and takes a piece of the department equipment with him, you know, yeah. being a Ruger, and that 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 says yeah. a, a lot too, because that's not done a whole lot. Hey, hey, nobody, you should leave us, but uh, <laughs> right. You know. Well, and he came in, you know, Bob Bob left for a variety of reasons. And, and uh, at the time, and did it the right way, he came in very respectfully, and he was dressed in a suit to say goodbye and to tell me what his plans were. And I, I remember that day very well because I'm having a conversation with him. I never entered my mind to, to not let him take Ruga with him. It just never came up. And so we're having this discussion, and I'm wondering to myself why it's continuing. I'm thinking that we've covered everything, and yet we're still in this discussion. And all of a sudden, I'm a little thick sometimes, so all of a sudden, in the middle of the, the questions he was asking me, it dawned on me. I said, he thinks I want to take this dog. And I said, Bob, do you th are you worried that we're going to take Ruger back? He said, well, Colonel, you know, he said, you put all the money in this dog, and, and people have donated, we've trained it, and we got all this equipment. And I, I started laughing. I felt kind of, he, he, he was kind of embarrassed, and I started laughing, and I said, I wouldn't take this dog, Bob, if, if I was told to do it. I would not. What am I going to do with him? He's your dog. He's part of the, the Mancini family. That's like taking your son. Okay, you're going to leave fishing game. Leave your son with me. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it just was unheard of to do that. And I said, look, that's the chance I take as a colonel when I give, ask you guys to make this huge commitment free of charge, quite frankly. They're, they're committed to these dogs seven days a week. They put – as you know, you never get paid for this. You know that. You committed hundreds of hours to a dog and never got paid for that. Now I'm going to take him? You're not going to do that. You sacrifice that um, when he goes. And I wished him well. Uh, I, you know, and then the, the best part of this story is the day came, not long after this, that Bob came to me to return. He, he, things had changed for him. He learned some good lessons in life. He, he physically improved. And, and so he made the decision that he would like to come back. He came in to see me in the same respectful way. I'd never done this in New Hampshire. New Hampshire had never hired anyone back. Uh, I'm going to always view this as one of the best decisions I ever made because I got an outstanding officer who has grown. He is a good example of the grass isn't always greener. I got her back. And the most interesting part, Wayne, was I called his wife, Amy, at near the end of this because even though Bob would tell you that Amy was all about him coming back to work. I knew better than that. He was a chief up there in his other job and he was home every night for dinner at five and coming back to fishing game, that was going to change. And you can tell me all day, your wife's good with that. I know better. I like Amy a lot. I called her up to thank her. I said, Amy, I just want to thank you. I know you're sacrificing, allowing him to come back. And I said, I just want you to understand how much we all appreciate it. 
And if there's ever anything I can do for you, I owe you. And she said, Colonel, I got to tell you, she said, I couldn't take another night of watching the two of them depressed in the living room. She said, Ruger literally is a changed dog since he got back into that cruiser. She said he was miserable and I just couldn't stand watching it any longer. It was kind of funny that they both were, uh, that she indicated that both of them were depressed. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a great story that, you know, and that was a good decision to let him take his dog. I don't know what I would have done with Ruler if I took the dog. So I, I just couldn't do that. No, if anyone wanted my dog, I think I would, I would kill them for that. So I'm <laughs> with anyone else. You can't. That's just ridiculous. So that's the chance we take. And you know, the one thing it did do is it made me aware that I have to put that out there. So I have to make the powers that be understand we are not going to be taking these guys' dogs. Back. So if there's any hesitation on this, we need to have this open discussion ahead of time because once these guys get these dogs, even if they're retired dogs, and, they, and I'm hopeful that we will have that, retired, healthy dogs. These guys are going to take these dogs home. They're part of their families, and, and that's not going to change. Under my watch, it's not going to change. So, um, And in this particular case, it worked out great. I got them both back. So that was a good decision. So, Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And, and this whole program is, is funded by donations, isn't it? It is. It, it, we never went to the state uh, asking for any funding for the program because we knew the well was dry and we couldn't fund some of the things that we have now. So in order to do this, we were going to have to fund it through donations. And in the beginning, it was a little rough. Wildlife Heritage Foundation came aboard, has been a tremendous help. Without their help, we wouldn't have a canine program. They've been super to work with. They've promoted the dogs. They've, they've promoted fundraisers. They're just great people to work with. I met with two of their ranking board members uh, this past week, as a matter of fact, and the question came up, uh, why wouldn't this, you know, they, they weren't, they weren't uh, asking for any other reason other, I think, than curiosity, but they did say, why wouldn't the state fund this? And I said, well, they probably would now because we've all seen, thank goodness uh, for the show, the Northwoods Law Show, we, it's been demonstrated over and over how valuable these dogs are on live TV for people to see. And so I don't think it would be a difficult push to go to the state of New Hampshire and say, listen, we got to fund these dogs and this is a good program. The problem with that, I think you lose some control, quite frankly, over how these dogs are used. I might lose the ability to make the decision that these dogs are not going to go anywhere. They're going to stay with the rightful owners if the state now becomes the legal owner of them. So unless I have to, I'd like to keep it the way it is. I think it's run very well. We have a, we have a good fund. It's pretty well established. We're buying cruisers uh, and we spoil them. These dogs have got cruisers, as you know, that start automatically. The air condition comes on when it's hot. If it's cold and they leave these dogs in those trucks uh, and it and overheats or gets uh, cold, excuse me, they start up and heat up. I am not going to lose a dog in a cruiser and whatever that, if you commit to a dog program, you've got to have, and I've been told by other chiefs and surrounding states uh, that they don't want their officers to talk to our canine officers here in New Hampshire because they find out the equipment we bought for them and it puts pressure on them to buy the same type of equipment. So <laughs> apparently we take good care of our dogs, but you know, they're a, they're an officer, Wayne, you know that. Yeah. And they hurt just like we do. They get sore, they get cold, they get hot. And, and if you're going to take care of your officers, you, you got to treat these dogs the same. So we do. We do just that. So, um, and it, it's the investment you got to make if you want great dogs. And, and every dime is worth it because we have great dogs. So, Right. And if people wanted to donate, it's the New Hampshire Wildlife Heritage Foundation and just earmark it for the dog program, right? The canine program, yes. The heritage. And the heritage is a great, anyone that wants to donate for any kind of cause involving uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game, the Heritage Foundation is an excellent source for that. There's some great people there with, that are very passionate about what we do and how we do it. And without their help and assistance, equipment purchases and safety equipment, I, I could go on all day about the things they've done for this agency. So they're a great source to make these donations. And you can, you can rest assured that the money that you donate will go for causes that you want it to go to. They're very, they're very careful about which is important. So yeah, that's a great way to supplement these programs. 
Great. And they're a nonprofit. So people, it's actually a write off for tax deduction. So that's great. And, and the other sure. thing we're doing with this podcast, Colonel, is we're incorporating the New Hampshire 4-H dog clubs because of COVID-19. We're not able to train. We're not able to get together with our dogs. We're not able to pass on the knowledge to these young kids. Uh, so we're, yeah, we're yeah. working through with them. And it's just, you know, you know that I was in 4-H and I showed dogs growing up. I became passionate about dogs I, I worked that into a uh, fishing game a little and now my son and since I've retired I've become a 4-H dog leader so <laughs> we're, we're doing something for the the youth and, and getting them connected to their dogs and what a great way it is because they can actually see these dogs on tv work and then learn a little bit more about them in the podcast kind of I always call it the backstage the Northwoods Law um, you know you get to actually the full story or hear hear a little bit more Great. Yeah, no, that's a great way to do it. And, and you know, it's good to get them started, at, as you know, like you did at a young age, too, because they'll be very knowledgeable as they grow older. Um, you don't see, you know, kids that, that uh, have relationships with animals at a young age become great adults. You don't, you don't see examples of them doing anything outside of being good adults, responsible adults. It teaches them a lot of teamwork. It teaches them a lot of respect. And, and the value of hard work. So it is a great program. I'm glad you got involved in it. And I know you had some judging uh, capability. So it's a, it's a good thing for Andrew, your son, to have you as an asset to show. And you guys have done pretty well, my understanding. Yes, he's, he's done extremely well his first year. He was, he was right at the top usually. So, um, yeah, so he's done very well with his dog. And I, I had a lot of things I had to learn because, you know, my breed was German Shepherd. He got a German wire hair pointer, totally different. But I have to take that step back and remember it's his dog, not mine. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that's difficult. <laughs> you know, and she can hunt with us, and uh, she's been a great companion that's for him. They're, 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 they're pretty – pretty tight and that's pretty watching all the 4-H kids with their animals and with their dogs it is it's it's that companianship and I hope I'm growing future game wardens that'll be canine handlers whether it's for our state or another state and you know everything I've talked to all these guys including Ken St. Pierre who's coming on as a dog handler which is pretty exciting and uh the aspect of getting another puppy and, and maybe a chocolate if that's what tests good, I, I'm hearing. So that would be kind of a, a, a nice addition to the fleet. <laughs> that's right, right. I talked to Wes, uh, the owner of um, Rise and Shine Kennels, where we get these dogs. And of course, though, I'm sure you've talked about that, but they're gen they've generously donated these dogs to us, which is incredible. I mean, he has uh, some of the, in my opinion, the top of the line hunting dogs uh, around and he takes he sacrifices uh one of these dogs all the time for us and uh, he told me the other day he was very excited that he had i remember he called me when we got moxie and if those folks that don't know moxie moxie is a is a blonde dog or a red dog and uh red center. yellow and yep, yellow we always had i'm sorry yellow we always had black we always had black uh, labs and so he was very apologetic when he's telling me about this puppy this round of puppies that he got and uh and I couldn't figure out what he was trying to tell me. And I said, you know, Wes, if you need me to purchase one, I'll do what I can because I understand that. And I'll, I'll be willing to do that. Your dogs are, are worth it. And I, I want to say that. And he said, no, no, that's not the problem. He said, the real problem is, Kevin, he said, the dog is yellow. And I said, yellow? You mean in color? He said, yeah. I said, Wes, I, I don't, that's the problem? He said, Wes, the dog can be purple. <laughs> the dog is in the line that these other dogs are I don't care what color it is I, I guess he thought that was going to be a big bombshell and and uh, I'd take a blue dog from West and Rise of the Channel I'll tell you it doesn't matter to me what color they are so he's very excited he called me the other day and said I might be able to get you a chocolate one I said that would be cool then I would have every color that would be great but again Wes not a deal breaker for me so whatever you can give me as long as it's out of that same or similar bloodline and they're as talented as the other dogs are. I'm, I'm good with that. So we'll see. But it would be nice to have a chocolate one. I like chocolate. Yeah, that neat. would be neat. And that's West Reed with Rise and Shine Kennels, right? And yeah, and anyone looking for a hunting dog, I'm telling you, you, you are missing the boat if you don't Google that and give him a buzz. Mm -hmm. They're not cheap dogs, but I don't think any of these hunting dogs are. But go to, I would encourage anyone to go to a show where he demonstrates the abilities of these dogs. And you watch for yourself. And if you leave there thinking that you shouldn't own one of them, 
you don't know what you're looking for because these are awesome dogs and he does a great job. They run a very nice kennel, a very clean one. Those dogs are not even in a kennel, they're in his home. Mm -hmm. uh, they, he's a dog lover too. So he's a great guy. I was just on the phone with him two days ago talking about this podcast as a matter of fact. So, uh, you know, he's a, he's a good asset for people that want to have a hunting dog. You know, they're great people. So right. they're he doesn't mind talking people. to you and educating you and all of that. So that's, that's definitely awesome. Wes is a great guy. And, you know, yeah. talking to all the guys through this, every time it comes out is your support colonel for their program. They train twice, twice the amount that they're required to train. You have them meet every Monday and that's very yeah. reflective in, in how they perform out there. And that, that says a lot that you're invested in much as much as everybody else is in this even, even more so. And, you know, Mark Hensel, who started our canine program, he had deserves credit for a lot of that because he started that rigorous training schedule. I think they train a little differently now than when Mark was there, but Mark started that once a week. And, you know, he came in and I was a captain, I think, at the time. He talked to the colonel at the time, Colonel Garabedian, and we thought that was a bit aggressive. State police only trains once a, once a month or, or twice a month. Um, but, again, you just like anything else, you get what you pay for. So these dogs are super dogs. They do a tremendous job. They don't make mistakes. And I attribute that to the fact that they train every week. It's a big hit for the districts that lose a guy. But we, we kind of worked with the lieutenants. We move them around so they're in different districts each, each week. Uh, COVID kind of put the damper on some of that. So they ended up training alone, which I didn't like. Because uh, you know it's better to train with, with people. They're getting, just getting back to that now. Um, but you're right that and that is a tribute to them to maintain that schedule because that's not as you know being a warden that's not an easy schedule to maintain no. you're committed a day of no matter what happens you're going to be training with your dog and that's that's huge but but they also I've also heard the excitement in their voice the officers and seen their faces when their dog saves a life and I'm sh and they've all done it all three of these dogs have done that, in my opinion uh, Ruger just recently so um, you know, that makes it all worthwhile. So I leave thinking, you bet we're going to train every week. And if they think we need to do it twice a week, that's what we're going to move to, you know, whatever it takes. That's what, you either, you got to jump into this right up to your ears or don't. And, and you're either going to, I don't want half a program. If we're going to have canines, I want working quality canines. And that's what we have. I'm very proud of them. And I'm very proud of the guys that have made them the way they are. And that's through their commitment. So yeah, it's a good, it's a good program. I'd like to have more. I've been, it's been a constant battle to get four. I've not yet been able to get it. I've gotten right on the edge and one of the guys left or, or we had to retire. It. So I'm, I'm hopeful that when Ken gets his, we'll hit that mark. Mm. But uh, I'd like to have, I, uh, the eventual goal would be six. Wayne, I'd like one in each district. I could see the advantage of that because they're crime fighters as well. They're not only rescue dogs, uh, search and rescue they they they're finding evidence and they're doing an outstanding job making cases so um, it'd be nice to have one in each district yeah bob's on his way tomorrow uh to do a felony case apparently look for some evidence in a felony case so take it sure. well state police are now calling them and i hope i don't offend anybody by saying this but uh state police are using our canines now for any outdoor crimes uh, to find evidence shootings uh, homicides domestic violences they've been called on all of that stuff um, uh, the, the one that, that was the most concerning for me was the murder that occurred a number of years ago in Conway uh, at the Army Navy store when they were robbed and, and the owner was killed and the, uh, the subject left there armed, went up the railroad bed and Mark Hensel was called with his dog to find poacher to find that individual and eventually did. So it's those kinds of calls that when these dogs are successful that it pays, all this training pays off. Mm. No. Thanks, Colonel, for joining us and sharing all that stuff. Thanks for being a dog lover and uh, <laughs> putting putting this on and uh, being so supportive of the guys. And uh, yeah, I think it, that it it adds so much to our agency, um, whether yeah. it's community policing, whether it's uh, finding evidence, yeah. whether it's finding people. Uh, these dogs have added so much to the New Hampshire Fish and Game Law Enforcement Division. So they're great yeah. dog officers. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for helping us pave the way, Wayne. A lot of people don't understand that you had one of the first dogs that we saw the value of this. So that, uh, that started this ball that we now have. So it was, uh, it was you know, it's worth taking a, for, the, for the chiefs out there that watch and listen to this. You know, if you get a guy that comes up with an idea, give him a shot at it. 
let him run with it because sometimes it's a great idea and in this case it was so we benefit every day because of it so thanks again well great colonel thanks for joining us <laughs> thanks for having me on Thank <laughs> you.